Hello, everybody. So today we are going to answer the question why big tech needs nuclear. Uh, so what's in the news? Microsoft has recently reached an agreement with Constellation to restart the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. Now, the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant is infamous uh, because of the meltdown that occurred in the 1970s. Uh, but what most people know who are in the nuclear know uh, that the first unit that was built and that didn't have a partial meltdown actually stayed in operation up until 2019. So for us, uh, nukies, it is not surprising that, that these plants can be revived. We saw that with Palisades uh, previously. Now we see it with Three Mile Island. And let's hope that there's a couple more uh, that can be revived in this way. So Microsoft said that it will buy the power produced by Unit 1 over the next 20 years. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Now, there's more news about data centers because data centers... Uh, the demand for data centers is, is at, at this moment, never ending. So this was in the Washington Post on June 21st. Uh, AI is exhausting the power grid and tech firms are, are seeking a miracle solution. More about these miracle solutions later. Uh, this was from earlier this year. Uh, the interesting thing that I've that I found in this article was actually uh, the text underneath the caption. Uh, it says the Vogel Electric Generating Plant in Georgia, which you can see in the picture. It's a quite artistic one where you see some grass and, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, the plant itself is beautiful enough. But what it says was demand for industrial power is surging in the state with the projection of electricity use for the next decade now 17 times what it was only recently. And I think that this is the result not just of growing uh, data center use, uh, because obviously uh, Georgia is also building a lot of data centers at this moment, um, but it's also because of onshoring. Uh, so what, ha what has happened in the past two decades is that all the Western nations have been offshoring all their work and all their industrial capacity. Uh, we sold our businesses to India or to China. And, and, and what, 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 what followed was that uh, industry was leaving the West. What we see now is that we, uh, we have come to the realization that we, that we need to balance things out a bit more, that we don't want to hand all the keys to China, uh, but th that we want to be able to produce some stuff ourselves. So I think that this is also an important driver why electricity demand may go up by 17 times in the next decade in Georgia. Uh, but back to data centers. So uh, before I became unemployed, and I became unemployed because I, am, I, I have a, a weird disability. There's nothing wrong with me uh, as far as physically. You can see I've got two arms, my, my mouth can't stop moving. Uh, I've got two legs, I can walk, I can run, uh, I, I can do athletic things, I can hoist uh, heavy stuff, you name it. But my disability is that I have a recurring depressive depressive disorder, which means that I become depressed. And this happens multiple times in a year, sometimes even multiple times a month. And this simply, simply precludes me from having a normal, normal job. No, no one is going to hire me knowing that they have to contend with me being sick two or three weeks in a row uh, while I have to do a job for them. But before all of this, um, by the way, the place that you're seeing right now is the place where I actually uh, where the symptoms of my depression became so pronounced that I have to I had to leave work. But what you see there is my former my former office. Uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse pointer at this moment, but you see the yellow the the yellow uh, squarish uh, figure around the building, uh, and then you see a round building. Now I used to work all the way in the top of this right of this round building, where I place the blue place marker. Now you, you see this 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 orange yellowy box. Uh, a little bit to the south of this uh, this rounded building. And that's where our servers used to be. And if you see the orange marker next to that building, that, that's where we used to park 
our backup generators and we had backup generators i believe it was about five megawatts so we had we had we had quite a bit a, a load of servers but back in the day they, they, i'm talking about 2008 right now if you had like a server park that was housed in a building like this i mean that used to be big but that's absolutely nothing these days and i'm going to show you this later on but now you know i used to be a server administrator so i know a little bit of this uh this this materi uh but 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 you know it, it's not that that relevant now so what's behind the news you know why would microsoft uh work with the owner of a nuclear power plant to get it restarted so worldwide what you see is that ever more people start using digital, you know, smartphones, computers. Uh, also, the fact that we we become more versed in using online services and online data, and 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 you see that that growth in that sector is is currently without end. I mean, there's no projection when it will end. It will probably end somewhere, but I mean. Um, just with the, the, just think about, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, not, not 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or even 15 years ago, having a, 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 a 1080p, uh, television wasn't the norm. People still had 720p televisions or even different formats than that. Uh, but now everybody has a, a 1080p television. So what do you want? You want to have the same quality you want to have 1080p uh, video for format streaming into your television that it can then show you now currently what i'm working on over here this is a 4k screen so preferably when i want to watch a video i want to see that in 4k which means that you now need more data coming through a bundle uh, which means that in the end this contributes to that growth it's not just screens it's it's also other things but this is just an example so the next step is 6k you know there's already cameras that can film 6k there's also going to be screens that can show you 6k so this is again going to contribute to the growth for uh, digital data digital services you name it now, the U.S. power demand for data centers is set to grow beyond 1,000 terawatt hours per year by 2030. Think about that, 1,000 terawatt hours. If you look at an AP1000, for instance, an AP1000 roughly generates, I believe it's about 8 terawatt hours per year, or is it 9? I, I can't call. Let's say that it is 10, okay? We, we, we size it that, it that it is 10 then you would need 100 AP1000s to power all of this demand. All this, all this energy needs to come from somewhere. It's all electrical energy, by the way. And, and, and if you, if you would, would, would uh, calculate it into continuous power, then you need 130 gigawatts of continuous power. And, and that's a very significant thing, because now I can talk from experience. When I was a server administrator, we used to have scarcity talks at our job and scarcity talks meant that if um you know we had growth our services were in high demand which meant that we need to uh, order new servers every month and install those servers in our in, in our infrastructure and at one point somebody saw okay listen now we're pushing the limits of what this building actually can hold and, and we were pushing the power limit so the, we were like we only had a couple of kilowatts left that we could use uh to 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 install these servers into now the issue about compute and data and everything is that the the power draw for these machines is relatively high and it stays relatively high it depends on what kind of service that you're that you're offering to your end user but usually you want to have the utilization factor of this server to be as high as possible in order to maximize profit it's the same with nuclear power plants servers are a little bit like nuclear power plants you have to be able to justify the cost so these servers they were running it's not flat out it's like 80 to 90 percent utilization 
uh, all of the time. And we're talking about servers that have about 1,000 watts of power draw at, at their maximum. Now, renewables can, can give you that. I mean, that's clear. Renewable production curves are squiggly lines, like completely jagged. Whereas a data center basically has a flat demand uh, line. It's not, it's not a curve. It's not, you know, there, there may be some variations in there depending on the services that you that, that you provide. But generally speaking, a, a, a data center uses uh, as much power as it can use all of the time pretty constantly. So that's why the renewables, I mean, yeah, there, there are still some data brokers out there, you know, uh, people who are trying to, to do the green stuff and say, okay, we buy only green electricity, so we are green. Uh, but that's just, that's just nonsense. Don't believe that bullshit. So the question, what does a data center do, is pretty relevant. So think about uh, what I used to do was I used to... Uh, for instance, I used to look at uh, the way the servers were running for the national train uh, company in the Netherlands, or the way uh, uh, you know whether the the environment for a certain ministry was running correctly, right? Like a, a department um, where, where where a secretary works. Um, I would look at whether those uh, systems were stable, whether there was anything that we needed to act upon. We would use to look at how we need to, you know, uh, expand certain things. We had to make sure that everything worked within this environment. Um, and I was also responsible re responsible for a uh, service that was called Backup Online. This is basically a data service. So if we break it down, what a, what a, what a, what a data center basically does is uh, host a lot of servers that can, that, that, that can offer uh, data or services to clients who need it. And when we're talking about data or services, we're talking about data for analysis, which can be anything. Uh, it can, can have to do with the weather. It can have to do with, uh, I don't know, uh, health insurance, how much cost, uh, you name it. There's all sorts of uh, data analytics going on, really. For this, you need access and compute, right? You need access to the data and you need compute power servers that actually manipulate the data in order to give you a certain result that you need. You have digital work environments, right? I mean, many people probably know what I'm talking about. If you work for a government or whatever, and you work at, from home, for instance, you want to log on to your environment where you can access your emails and your files and you can collaborate with other users and such. So that, that's basically a digital work environment also requires access to files, access to a environment, and it also needs compute. Uh, then you have a file servers. This is basically only access. Uh, think about YouTube, what you're looking at right now. Videos needs mostly access, not that much compute, although for certain algorithms, you do want compute. If YouTube says, okay, here's a recommended video, that recommended video only comes after a whole uh, a, a giant algorithm has checked whether you belong to a certain audience or not. And AI, uh, the, this is the, the, the big one at this moment, uh, that's driving the, re the need for compute power in data, serve, uh, data centers at this moment, very heavily, very heavily. So how does a data center do this? You have to, you have to uh, imagine that a data center is something like, uh, like a train yard. Right, so uh, uh, a, a bundle of cables comes in, and then you have a couple of servers that basically say, "Okay, uh, uh, messages from from this user or messages for this server need to go that way, and uh, this goes that way." And there's also a lot of load balance load balancing involved there. You want to make sure that all your servers have the same workload in essence. Um, and, and, and uh, in the end, what you have is rows upon rows and stacks upon stacks upon stacks of servers 
Now, most in my time, all of these servers, all of these servers did something else. Uh, there was a server that did uh, that did uh, the national railways. There was a server that did uh, the work environment for the police. There was, a, you know, there's all, all sorts of different servers. So you needed a pretty intelligent server in the front that made that that was able to dish out all of this work to all these servers where it belonged to. But these days, I believe there's more. Uh, harmonization going on. So if you think about chat G GPT, for instance, that that's no longer one server. That's a building with, with uh, it, it's probably with like a couple of hundred servers. Each of these servers, again, has like 20 or 24 or maybe even 50 virtual servers that all do this chat GPT work. And then in front of that, you have a couple of servers that, that, that make sure that the load balancing is correctly and that... What what happens is you as a client you you say okay Chat GPT I want to use you. What happens is a, 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 a message goes to one of these servers. These servers looks at where is a, a, a virtual machine that is currently available for this work, and then it basically establishes a route between your computer and that server. And when you tick into uh, the browser, whatever you want it to do you know, uh, please uh, analyze this or this for me, then uh, a pathway between your computer and that virtual ChatGPT server is established and then ChatGPT can compute whatever it needs to compute for you. That, that's, that's basically, in essence, how it works. It's, it's a simplified, simplified, down-to-earth version of it. Um, but when you look at... Um, and it from, if, when you look at it from a pr practical perspective, what what happens inside this data center? I, I found this picture here on the internet while I was Googling it, and it's just perfect. Uh, you see the red side on top, right? You see utility power coming in, you have transformers, uh, you also have backup generators, and you have your power distribution nodes. So what happens is the power then gets delivered to those servers. Those servers do what they were designed for doing. So they, they either compute or they grant access or uh, they, they give you a video or something like that. And the thing that, that is very important here is that you also see a blue part. This is what I'm going to, uh, let's see, uh, let, let, let me take this here. And let's 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 put this there so I can I can uh, I, I can explain this. Oh, what? Right. It's no longer there. <laughs> well, then it goes back. Okay. So let's let's suppose that if this this computer that I'm sitting right next to, right, this 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 computer has like a 750 watt power supply unit. Each of these servers probably has somewhere between 500 and 1,000 watts of workload. And they probably have two uh, two power supply units because there needs to be redundancy. Uh, each of these servers generally uses, let's say, around seven or eight or nine hundred watts uh, continuously. So you need that power to come in, right? That's what the red side does of this picture. But what also happens, and this is this is a bit counterintuitive, but when you put 500 watts of power into a computer those 500 watts are not effectively being used to to do work right in the sense that uh in a sense that it's very efficient it's actually very inefficient so when you put 500 watts in what you see is that there's also like 400 and 450 watts coming out of heat so heat is being generated in these electrical components. And it's almost, it, 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 it's like 90% of the, of the power that, that gets put in is actually turned into heat. So you need to cool these systems down because otherwise you get malfunctions. Not just malfunctions, but actually chips can get fried, right? They're not literally fried, but there's like a, a, a burnout in a transistor somewhere. And then basically the, the, the chip is dead. So <clears throat> practically speaking, when you look at like, when you look at a, a data center like this, what you see is you have a, a power hungry pack of servers that needs to be provided uh, 
<clears throat> stable electricity, uh, there is a backup source for that electricity is always available. Uh, you need to transform it down, obviously, because these, these servers only use two, 220 volts or maybe 230 vo volts, depending on where you are. Um, and, and, and they then transform it down to 12 volts in their power supply units. And all this power gets turned into, into actually uh, the providing of data and the providing of services, but the end result of it is that a lot of heat is produced and this heat needs to be evacuated from the building. And that's what the blue stuff does. So there are chillers. The chillers make sure that cool air gets gets basically blown into the building and then on the other side somewhere you have uh, fans that make sure uh, that you extract the heat from the building. So that's how a, a, a data center practically works. Now the shortages are coming. This is the reason why Microsoft is talking to, three, to, talking to Constellation. They know they are going to need power in the future. Now, this is data that I got from the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, they have basically uh, analyzed that in the future, uh, what is going to happen is that we are going to need roughly 130 gigawatts. And, you know, it, it, it's, go it, it's going to grow well out of the bounds of what we can currently produce with our uh, electricity uh, with our electricity production. So this is just data from what we have right now. I'm sorry, this, this should have said something something else, but that's okay. Uh, what you see here is that, uh, let's see, do I want to do this, this, or this? Yes. So what you see is um, the, the biggest concentrations, the biggest concentration of data centers at this moment is in North, Northern Virginia. There's about 300 uh, data centers there. And in total, they almost use four gigawatts of power. So you see that the, 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 the power demand for that, for this industry already is quite big. And these are just the, the largest concentrations of data centers, but there's many, many, many more data centers in the United States. So remember when I said we will come back to this, so uh, AI is exhausting the power grid, tech firms are seeking a miracle solution. So some of them are looking at fusion, so Microsoft is working with Helium. Uh, then you have the small nuclear reactors, you have Terra Power, for instance, uh, also by, by or not also, but a company owned by Bill Gates. Google apparently is also trying to do geothermal energy. Then there's some hydroelectricity, but as we all know, hydroelectricity is pretty much tapped out. Uh, we have, you know, there there is still some capacity that could be built, but looking at what it is it, you know there's there's not much that can be gained there uh, and this is contrary to what one mark c jacobson uh, tried to make us all believe uh, that we could expand hydroelectric capacity by 15 times which is obviously uh, impossible and then finally you have uh, natural gas now this is my own sentence and I wrote it down because I, I wanted to make sure that I got this across as clearly as I could possibly get it. So the data industry is a strictly on-demand industry that won't let itself be capped by the availability of wind or sun. It will draw power from whichever source it can and it doesn't matter to the client whether that is wind, solar, hydro, nuclear or even gas and coal. Just think about it. You're watching this video on YouTube currently. I hope that you like and subscribe, by the way, if you haven't already. But do you care where the electricity comes from that makes the data center that is hosting this video let you watch this video? It's a serious question. If you say, yes, I do care, I, I don't want it to be cold, well, then, then, you've got, then, then you've got your work cut out for you because most data centers really, they, they don't care that much about where they get their electricity. They just want to be able to sell you the service that they make money of. 
because it's a business. They need to make money. And they really don't care where the electricity comes from as long as it is not cost prohibitive. And let's go to the map, because this is, this is something that I personally like doing very much. So here we have the old building where I used to work, and I've prepared a lot of stuff for us to watch. Uh, so let's see. Now, I, I didn't do the entirety of, of the United States, uh, but I wanted to show you a couple of things just to make, make a point. So right now, what I'm zooming into, this is the Facebook data center, and it's, I believe it's in, in Oregon somewhere, uh, in Prince or Prineville, Prineville. So remember that I said that they need, uh, you know, they need power whenever they can get it, all the time, preferably. What you see near practically every big uh, data center is a switchyard. And here you can see there's a switch yard, here's a switch yard. Uh, there are no more switch yards over here. Uh, but, but what you can see and the way you can uh, pretty, the way you can, dis, the way you can see where data centers are is basically all this infrastructure that is built surrounding these boxes. You can always see that there is something of a, you know, that they're, they're always, uh, the, 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 I believe that these are uh, generators. These are generators. There's always something that is there either to generate uh, power or to cool something down. That's 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 almost that 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 really is the hallmark of uh, of data centers. These things here that can be two things. Some sometimes these things are water if they use chillers, but if these are backup generators, which I suspect that they are. Then these are diesel uh, diesel tanks because they need diesel. Whenever the power grid fails, they want to have power uh, regardless, and and they cannot they cannot have disruptions in uh, in, in in availability. Uh, San Jose, you know, this is uh, Silicon Valley over here. What I've done what I've done is I, I've drawn the outlines of the major uh, data centers in there, but. If you think that Silicon Valley would have a big data center community, you, you're absolutely wrong. <laughs> First, we're going to, uh, this is Phoenix. Let's go to San Antonio. San Antonio is very important for Microsoft. So here they are building, uh, here they have, uh, this is one of the large data centers from Microsoft in San Antonio. As you can see in our switch yard, uh, here are, the data centers, the the, 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 the the physical data centers over here, they are building new data centers. And the, the common theme here is that everywhere where you see data centers, you can see construction projects nearby. Here's another data center under construction, and I know that it is a data center because I checked it. Uh, and then over here, I believe that this is the location where ChatGPT runs, and they have multiple ChatGPT Chat uh, locations obviously um, but let's go to northern Virginia because that's really impressive what what happens there did I say Virginia I said I said Virginia so here is the largest collection of uh, data centers in the United States and it's it, it's absolutely massive it, it, it's completely bonkers actually if you see how much how much of this real estate that we need for data centers it's it's just mind-boggling so here you can see this is the whole new project here they are building new data centers whenever you see something like this you know like a like a parking lot that's not used for anything i guarantee you there will be a data center there within now and 10 years uh, this is the same thing over here as well i made a purple place marker for that uh, if you look here, I know that this is a data center in, under construction. Well, this is already realized, but I, I'm willing to accept that this is going to be a data center as well. It's 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 it's, it's really impressive. But this is Manassas, right? I believe that this is Manassas. Yes, this is Manassas. Let's go up to Dallas Airport. This is absolutely astonishing. What is taking place here? Just look at. Uh, the, the just I mean I'm lost for words the, all of this all of this 
everything that you can see here within these yellow lines, all of that, that's data centers. Now over here, what you see here, you know, there is uh, there is a hotel here. Uh, there's some restaurants here. There's some 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 parking space here. I don't know what this is. Maybe it's an administration building for one of these data centers over here. You know, th these are commercial co commercial uh, com commercial buildings, but they're basically enveloped by data centers. And 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 believe me, that this is just the beginning. Now, what I forgot to do, and I let's let's uh, let's take this here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, to give you some logic, right? So let's remove this. You don't need to read it. I think that there are three options for what is going to happen in the in the future, uh, and here is what I would call the nuclear data center logic. Uh, this could also be called the uh, nuclear fusion or the nuclear fission data center lo logic. Personally, I don't, I don't care whichever way it goes. But if you are serious about using nuclear to power data centers, start with talking with Westinghouse. Start by talking with, you know, whoever is building anything currently, and say how fast can you give us this, because. You have to be able to build something like an AP-1000 in five years. Should be possible. Six years, you know, or look like an or look like look at an X-300, for instance, which should be able, which they should be able to construct in twenty-eight months. That was what they said on their on their uh, on their on their spreadsheets. I don't know if that's still possible or whether that is even feasible, but you should try it. So here's the logic, right? First, what they will do is what is happening right now in uh, Harrisburg. Let's go to Harrisburg. Uh, let's see, there's Harrisburg. Here's Three Mile Island. So what is possible here? Two things are possible. Either uh, Microsoft simply says, okay, we will buy whatever power you can produce and we will pay you for it, but we will we will use this electricity in whichever data center we, we have, whether that is a, on the other side of the country or not. We know that we will get the electricity whenever we need it. We know that it's not necessarily the electricity that was produced by Three Mile Island, but the certificate of origin that we have says that it does, which is what is happening in the Netherlands right now, for instance, where a couple of these, uh, I believe it's Google, Google has a certificate of origin for wind power. So they say we are 100% wind powered. That's what, that is currently what is happening right now. Now, the, the, the benefits of this is that you, you show that nuclear is relevant, right? But the drawbacks are that you have, uh, you, you are still uh, attached to the grid, which means that all the stuff, you know, all the increased burden for maintaining a heavy renewables grid with backup and with gas generators and with additional trans, uh, transmission and distribution uh, costs are also going to be put on you as a data center because you're not physically next to the nuclear power plant. So the next option that you're going to get is, is, is let's, let's, let's simply draw a map here, right? Let, let's draw this map. Okay, let's suppose that Microsoft says, okay, we can buy this uh, this 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 piece of land over here. And what we are going to do is we are going to tap right into into this uh, we we you know here's here's the switchyard over here. There's the electric substation. What we are going to do is we are going to uh, draw a new line directly between the nuclear power station and Three Mile Island. Okay, let's turn this into red. So that's the future. I believe that this is the future of, 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 uh, of the, the nuclear data center logic. So what you, what you do is you move your, you build your new data center right next to the nuclear power plant. And the benefits that, will, that it will give you is that you, you cut out all the grid burdens, right? Everything that you have that you would have to pay for but not use. You don't have to use, you don't have to pay for it anymore. You just have your nuclear power plant. You have one line 
which need which requires some maintenance and, and 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 someone to watch it you know to make sure that it stays working but that's 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 like this compared to this where you need to carry the burdens of all the other stuff now the drawback of this because there are drawbacks and, and it depends on how you look at it now harrisburg is a i mean it, it's like a province town in the united states right it's 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 not big it's 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 small so the drawback is that you're moving your data center to the boonies the proverbial boondocks now to to some degree this this makes this necessitates that your the people who work there depending on how far they want to drive each day that they have to either live in this neighborhood here or if they are willing to drive for an hour and a half they can live in baltimore or they can live in wilmington or perhaps even move to philadelphia or if they want to drive for two hours they can go to washington i mean it's up to them really they could say well i, I like that or not so so there's a little risk there involved for the data center because the question is are you going to get the people you know the, the quality of people that you need in order to operate this uh, data center. And the other thing is that network infrastructure, right? So if you look at uh, data, the, the way data is transported over the network, uh, it, it is likely that that the, the network infrastructure between Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York is better right so you have more bandwidth going there there's there's a lot of that de de dedicated lines going there is better than it is between uh washington and harrisburg for instance so let's 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 just represent this with a with a line and it's not as thick as that as as, as the other line so this is this is a possible constraint I mean, this is what we used to run up against when when I was still working uh, at KPN, because what we did was pretty simple, right? We we were over here, all the way in the boondocks of the Netherlands, right? So the data cable had to run through Amsterdam, Utrecht, Zetogenbos, Eindhoven, and then somehow it would end up here, right? And the data cable had sufficient bandwidth so that we could do the little that we could do when we were doing it back then, right? But at some point, what happened was the demand became bigger. So here you have Skiphole, and we used to have a data center somewhere around here. I believe this is it, right? So when you look at the data cable that runs from Amsterdam to Schiphol, which is the national airport, not only was it shorter, but it also had a heck of a lot more bandwidth than, than our cable. So what ended up happening, I mean, it, it should be obvious to anyone who sees this, is that we decided that we wanted to build our uh, data center there, and we wanted to build a data center there, and we wanted to build a data center there somewhere, instead of having a data center down here. Right? So this is this is data data center logic, right? You you want the bandwidth. Bandwidth is really important. So there's a third option, right? Right now we've spoken about two options. The option one is we buy our electricity at a nuclear power plant. We have a certificate of origin, and we say, "Look, we are we are pro nuclear people. We buy our electricity from a nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant stays operational, but you get the drawbacks of all the added costs of the grid that you don't want to have." Second option is you move a data or you build your new data center right next to an existing. Uh, nuclear power plant somewhere. The third option is you talk to Philadelphia or you talk to Washington or it, I mean, this is probably going to be decided at a state level, right? So you talk to uh, what is this? Baltimore is Pennsylvania, I believe. Yeah, it's Pennsylvania. 
So what you do is you talk to Baltimore and you say, okay, listen, um, there used to be an air base somewhere or there used to be a nuclear power plant over here somewhere. I believe that it is decommissioned. Uh, you're going to look for a site that is near this big data line over here you create a new you, you you create a new campus over here, right? There you built your you you built your your campus your 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 data campus over there. You're going to add your nuclear power plant over there. So you start with your nuclear power plant actually, because that that that's that's the beginning, right? I'm just I'm just drawing on a map. I'm not 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 looking for anything serious, by the way. It doesn't need to be as big as this, obviously. So what you do is you make sure that you can hook into into this in, into this big data line over here. You want to hook, be able to hook into that, right? And you want to have as you want to have max bandwidth. So that's the third option. You're both going to site your new nuclear power plant and your new data center somewhere where you have cheap access to a lot of bandwidth. And you can actually have whatever you need to, you know, ensure that you can get a construction permit for a nuclear power plant. This is the future. This is what I believe should happen in the future, right? Uh, doesn't have to be here. Oh, by the way, Baltimore is Maryland. Sorry, I missed, <laughs> misspoke. I just saw the state lines here. <laughs> well, I don't live in the United States, so I, I hope you can forgive me for that. But that's the logic. That's the logic. And uh, the reason is simple. You want the bandwidth and you want the power. And you, you want to have that combined. Having that together makes for the ideal business case. So right now what you see is it's it's still a little bit scattershot. They are building their they they are building their their uh their data centers wherever they can build them. Usually, it's quite near where there's a huge, uh, where there's a lot of uh, data centers existing uh, near a big town, like like here in Atlanta, for instance. I believe that there's a, a, a new, um, there there's there's like a new uh, development going on here in Fayetteville. There's already a, a a data center over there, and there's some data centers over here. By the way, it's it's no coincidence that usually when you look at a, a, an air an, an airport or something like that, so some something big near a near near a big city, that that's also the place where you can see the developments of uh, data centers data centers happening. But in any case, that's that's what I wanted to talk to you about these data centers. I believe that data centers and nuclear power are. Uh, or a logical match, but in order to make sure that nuclear and data centers can match in a way that you can actually get new deployments of both nuclear and new data centers, uh, firstly, the data centers have to accept that this new nuclear power plant will come online uh, slightly after they will come online. Uh, and and there has to be some uh, some some regulatory work, some some work with the state, some work with all the internet service providers, in order to make sure that you can that you have access to the best bandwidth possible. So yeah, I believe that nuclear and data centers are a good match. Now you reached the end of this video. I want to thank my Patreon supporters because these are the people who make a. Uh, 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 a reasonable life for somebody who is disabled as I am uh, possible. I want to thank the Anthropocene Institute, Canon Bryan, Christopher Bergen, Daniel C., Romek Pavlowitz, Andy K., Anton Tapani, Brian Campbell, Chris Kiefer, and Emil, and my good friend Eric Meyer uh, for their gracious support. If you want to support the channel, please go to Patreon and pledge whatever you can pledge. I do this per video. But do note, I do this, uh, I, I, I only uh, place uh, five videos on Patreon, uh, paid for by Patreon supporters per month. And uh, if you want to help the channel grow, please leave a comment down below and make sure that you subscribe and leave a like. And that's it. Thank you all for watching. And may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye.